Yeah, that water's cold, man. I knew it was gonna be cold water, but I didn't know it was gonna be cold water. It was like 52 degrees. Phil managed to catch his first few fish on the fly, and he was like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm booked. Like, isn't predation an issue with them as well? Like, don't raccoons raid nests and eat eggs and stuff like that? So chronic waste disease is a TSE, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. There is a cannibalistic tribe in Papua New Guinea that for years and years, actually I think it was maybe even been decades, that they were losing women and children. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot. You're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. I'm Russell, and with us is Jose today. He's actually in, which we're excited about. So we got an episode for you. It's going to be a little bit of a short one. We're going to do another Snapshots episode, and he's kind of going to be talking about everything. I don't even know what we're talking about today, so it's going to be a fun one. <laughs> so how goes it, bro? <laughs> oh, man, it's uh, it's going, man. It's been quite the week so far. How's, how are you doing? Same, man. It's uh, It's been a week, but uh, we're here. We're here to talk, get some stuff off our mind, get our minds <laughs> off other stuff. So uh, I'm For excited, sure. man. Oh, dude, same. So I guess before we get started, man, we can recap. Would you, uh, would you do any outdoorsy things this weekend? Not really. <laughs> I, went out, <laughs> I went out on the lake. Um, so you met my buddy Joe from up here, right? And uh, yes, yeah, yeah, we yeah, went out yeah. on, the, on the river one time. Well, uh, we took his boat out on the lake and um, went all over the lake. So he lives on the lake, kind of across the lake from where I live. And so he could just pull up right to the marina across from where I live. And I could just hop on his boat and we go from there. And we rode all over the lake. It was me, him, his daughter, and his wife. And uh, we rode all around and rescued some 17-year-old kid out on a jet ski, sitting in the middle of the lake. I guess jet ski died on him. What? So, oh. yeah, he <laughs> rescued him, towed him back to his place. And then we continued on up and went to the, the dam over uh, the dam that releases from Lake Wachita. And that water's cold, man. I knew it was going to be cold water, but I didn't know it was going to be cold water. It was like 52 degrees. And, uh, so we jumped in and swam for a little bit and it's, oh man, it was like needles piercing your skin cold, but it felt Jeez, good dude. and it helped out with some inflammation I've been having in my knee. So that's good, but nice. uh, that's some cold water, but that's <laughs> pretty much what we did. And then of course, you know, I like every Sunday I play football in the afternoon. So, um, it was pretty good, man. What about nice, you? Man. You do anything outside? Oh dude. Well, what day was that? I think it was Saturday. Um, I called Marco, or Marco actually called me Friday. I, I, he's been on the podcast a few times at this point. Good friend of ours. He called me Friday, and then we just started talking. He asked me what my plans for the weekend were. I said, dude, I really don't know. I, I want to try and get some fishing in. So I was thinking about going to the San Marcos River. And uh, I like to go there before, like, at least the part in town, before it gets too crazy with swimmers and tubers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes, dude, I want to get out too, man. You, uh, you, you down to go try and chase some carp? I was like, dude, heck yeah. So... We ended up planning a trip out to the hill country, try and find some carp. Um, we're supposed to meet him at six. I will. Let me rephrase. I was supposed to meet him at six for the first time. And I don't even know how long I try and pride myself on like not being late whenever I'm meeting with people to go fishing. I forgot to set my alarm <laughs> 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 and uh, I woke up because I got one of those like, um, I don't know, one of those like emergency alert things on my phone. And I noticed that the light was coming through my window pretty, like, it was pretty bright. I was like, dude, what time is it? And I look at Marco. I texted me 40 minutes, like, before I woke up at 6 o'clock on the dot pretty much. It was like 6.40 something when I woke up. I was like, oh, my God, dude. So I, I called Marco. I said, hey, dude, you, are, you are you still up? He goes, yeah, man, I'm just chilling at the house. Like, you still want to go? He goes, yeah, dude, I'm down. So I, I hurried up real quick, got some, threw on some clothes, grabbed my fish and stuff, and I went out to his place. And um, I guess it all worked out because his – his neighbor who lives across the street from him, he's a really cool dude. He's a chef at a uh, really popular like um, pizza and, and beer garden thing in, in, in Austin called uh, Pint House. And uh, really, he's a really cool dude. Met him a few times. And the last time I was talking, like I hung out with Marco, he actually came over and he was, um, he'd been getting into archery. So he's been shooting his bow a lot and stuff like that. He started talking about that. He had been, ex he expressed interest in trying fly fishing. 
So Marco's like, you know what? You know, since we're still here, I'm going to shoot him a text if he wants to join. And, and he ended up coming. And it was his first time going fishing with us or going fly fishing, period. And uh, so we gave him like a quick casting lesson. We took him out and uh, the fur, we hit two different part or two different uh, rivers. And uh, wait, same river, two different sections. Sorry. <clears throat> and um, first section, we didn't, we saw like one carp on the way out, but it was um, pretty much dead otherwise. And the water was super murky. And uh, he's, I didn't really know it, but that guy, Phil, is, is into birds. He's, uh, I guess he's a birder also. And um, I'm, I'm kind of a little, little bit of a bird nerd myself. And so there's a painted bunting I had heard. And I was able to call him in using a, uh, an app on my phone. And Phil was freaking out. He was, dude, because I've been waiting for like four years to see one of those birds. And he was super stoked. I was excited to kind of share that with him too. And, and uh, it was really cool to see that. Go to the next spot. And... It's the water was a bit clearer, a little bit shallower in some spots. Did see more carp, but they were it was it was super hot. We got there like at noon, so I mean not ideal. Was, uh, the water was super warm. The, the 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 sun was pretty much like, I mean the sun was like super high in the sky, and and wind was not blowing too much, and it was just really 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 hot, and the fish were just kind of pretty lethargic for lack of a better word and uh so needless to say we didn't really get any shots at these carp but phil managed to catch his first few fish on the fly and he was like dude i'm i'm, I'm hooked and so <laughs> we um we ended up going to a brewery twisted x uh, on the way back and uh had some food drank some beers and uh he was just asking us about rods and reels and stuff, so I think he's probably gonna pick him up and pick himself up and pick himself up something soon. And uh, yeah, man, it was it was pretty cool to take uh, take someone for the first time to go fishing, get on some fish and everything, and and uh, feel him get ex- and see him get excited about all that stuff. And and yeah, man, so I think he he might be joining the, the fly fishing club, so to speak. So it's pretty pretty awesome. I didn't yeah, catch. Awesome. I, I caught. I, yeah, I mean, I had a pretty slow day, but uh, it was all worth it. Dude. It was. It was pretty, pretty sweet. So, even though I woke up late, it uh, worked out in the end. So, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. On the yeah, episode man. that comes out before this one, it's not coming out yet, but it'll it'll be out by the time this episode comes out. The one that came out last week, <laughs> when you're listening, <laughs> um, we talked about how because he's a guide uh, up here in Arkansas, mm-hmm. and so he was talking about there's just something about teaching somebody and watching their gears move as they catch their first fish that is just something that'll be burned in your memory at all times. And, yeah. And uh, I've experienced that myself as well. And so that's exciting that you're able to do that for somebody. Yeah, dude, it was really cool. Cause uh, <clears throat> I mean, everyone, it doesn't matter who you are, like how quick you pick things up. Don't matter. When you start fly fishing, everyone's cast like needs work. Right. Yeah. I mean, even like mine now, many years into it uh still need some fun some fine tuning for sure i could always i could always use improvement but dude this guy in a matter of i don't know an hour i i saw his casting improve dramatically it was crazy and then i taught him how to do a roll cast and he was roll casting at like 30 feet like it was nothing i mean it was pretty awesome to see him dude, just kind of awesome. just kind of get into it yeah dude and so i think marco i don't know if he's going to pick up his own like like uh go out and get his own thing like new from some shop or if Marco's going to cut him a deal. Cause it sounded like Marco was going to try and hook him up. So I don't know, man, but uh, yeah, dude, it'd be, it'd be awesome to get him on the podcast and oh, for have sure. him talk about, about his experience and everything. And, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll need to talk to him and see if we can work that out. But um, dude, I think it, it was, it was a blast. Dude. It was, it was really, really fun. So did, did you or Marco catch anything? I caught, I caught a little bass and a little, long gear and i think that was it just those two little dudes marco i believe marco caught a sunfish i don't know what type i think it was red breast um not sure <laughs> marco's got a funny story we'll have to we'll have to get him on here to tell it <laughs> if he's willing to it was freaking hilarious bro and then uh, oh dude i oh man Pardon my pardon my French, but dude, I ate shit twice on, on that <laughs> on that creek. We were like on this embankment. It was a pretty steep, pretty steep little bank, and we're trying to like get down into it. And it was really, really overgrown on the edge. So we're I was trying to get down and my foot got caught up on some grass so when I tried to go forward. Dude, I got dude, I phase planted in the water. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, oh dude it, i mean it didn't feel bad because it was so hot so I was like you know yeah. it could be worse and then later on and then dude the water i mean the rocks are just so slippery and i don't have uh felt bottoms on my on my wading boots i don't really like to use felt bottoms mm-hmm. and uh so i was just kind of like trying to shuffle and then dude i freaking ate it man my, i just lost my footing and i landed hard on my shoulder dude it, <laughs> it sucked i just kind of picked myself up i had to stand there and like Compose myself, dude. I I ate it hard, man. It was Damn. it was bad. It was really bad. So it was it was an eventful day for all of us. We all had something cool. <laughs> something happened to us that day. It was hilarious, dude. It was it was a memorable day for sure. Damn, how are you feeling now? You're not hurting still, are you? Oh no, nah, nah. my pride a little bit, but physically I'm good. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> man. Oh man, that's freaking awesome, though. So. uh you said we have a jack wagon of the week. Several jack wagons of the week. Um, yes, sir. So this came from MeatEater.com. Six Louisiana men were arrested for cheating at a at actually two hog hunting contests in the Bayou State. So apparently, these fellows had been going to Texas, trapping hogs at a landfill there, hauling them back to Louisiana. I guess pinning them or setting them up, whatever, somewhere, and then going to them and I guess using them for the contest. And there were already some kind of, some people kind of being suspicious about it. And after some interrogation came to light pretty quickly. So these guys were charged with a total of 19 felonies and nine misdemeanors. And, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, uh, We've been seeing a lot of cheating lately in the outdoor space. There's a whole walleye controversy a while mm-hmm. back. I saw something recently about like a, a, another tournament angler somewhere. And then these guys, apparently it's not just in the angling community. We have them in the hunting community as well. Yeah. And uh, so these dudes, I'm not sure if they're barred from competition. I imagine they would be, but yeah, these guys are some Jack wagons for sure. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So what was the competition that they were in? Was it just like, getting the most hogs or or what was the competition does it say that's a good question i have no idea uh i just skimmed over it so i may have i may have skimmed over that particular portion of the of the article but um yeah and i forgot to write their names so if anybody is interested on seeing who these jack wagons are you can head over to meat eater and they'll have the article there i'll put the link in the description as well but man and and there's so many things that are wrong with that not only you know morally and ethically but what happens if those hogs get out? Then you're yep. introducing, you know, more of the problem. <laughs> yeah. And not only that, but you're not supposed to transport animals across state lines without mm-hmm. USDA uh, uh, approval. Essentially, these guys didn't get that. So that's another another issue there. So, and I mean, if these things have like, I don't know, like uh, some kind of disease, you can be transferring that as well. So yeah. it's uh, it's not a smart move in, in any aspect of this whole situation. So these guys are, I think, have rightfully earned the title of Jack Wagon or uh, Jack Wagons of the Week. I agree, one hundred percent. We need to we need to create a sound bite for that, dude. Dude, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to get on Fiverr or something and see if somebody can make something for us. For or if sure. anybody out there is like some type of audio creator i don't even know what would that job be considered audio creator or something i don't know Man, i don't know that's a good if question. anybody out there likes to make funny sounds <laughs> let us know <laughs> <laughs> we may commission you for something dude for sure i think <clears throat> i think it'd be a, a a good little addition to this podcast but all right uh, so addition so in addition to the jack wagon of the weeks i have three uh potential topics so i'll read them off to you and we can okay. discuss whatever you think may be most uh, interesting or relevant. So the first one is, are chronic wasting disease fears making people quit deer hunting? This comes from OutdoorLife.com. The other is, hunting and fishing makes us better environmental stewards, study shows. And then there is another one, Texas bird hunters helped fund a new drug that's saving quail. I saw that quail one. Outdoor Life had that one, right? Yes. I think actually all these three came from Outdoor Life. They're, they're really good topics this time. I feel like the first one, chronic wasting disease, I don't know too much about CWD. Uh, okay. The second one, 
I mean, I feel like that's a given. If you're out there hunting, fishing, it's because you love doing it. And if you love doing it, you want to save it. I feel like that's kind of thing, but I'm interested. I'm a nerd and I'm interested in the drug for saving quail. Okay. I don't, I don't think that'll take too much time. So you could probably do this one in another one given time okay. constraints. But so this one essentially, it was a drug called Quail Guard developed by or developed at Texas Tech. Um, and backed by Texas bird hunters. So essentially populations in quail have been decreasing over the years and no one really knew why. I mean, they're, they're kind of prone to these boom and bust cycles. Um, a lot of it is drought and habitat loss. The quail tend to be, I guess, more uh, rain dependent and such. So in years of drought, we have lower, um, populations and in, in years of, of, of high rains, we have that populations, populations tend to do better. But in some scenarios where you have both, they were still, the populations were still not doing too well. And so I guess it got people thinking like why that may be. If both things are present, you know, in theory, they should be doing okay. And they found out that there's like some, um, health concerns with these quail and the populations, mostly parasites that are, um, causing some issues with the populations. And so this has been, I believe, a decade plus in the making. It's taken a decade or a little more than a decade of research and testing. And it's the first FDA approved drug for wildlife. And it's pretty cool that it was backed by hunters from the great state of Texas, my home state. So making me a little bit proud there. But yeah, man, these, this new medication should be available, uh, for public purchase in the fall, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. How is it applied? Do you know? It's a feed. Okay. Yeah. That's so just cool. uh, like a, like a supplemental, I, I guess it's uh, like a supplemental food thing. You just kind of put it out there and hopefully, you know, the quail will, will find their way to it. I'm not really sure how, it, how it'll be distributed. Don't yeah. really, I didn't do, I mean, I, I did this. I found this like maybe 10 minutes before coming over. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought it was cool. So I, I, I skimmed over it briefly. That is pretty but, cool. Uh, yeah, man. So it's, pretty neat and uh, i guess it for all the bad publicity hunters get this is one of those good things that you know they can we can really wear on our on our sleeve and be proud about you know yeah. that it was this hunter backed medication that's freaking awesome so you've done quite and the amount of of study on quail back in undergrad didn't you or was it in your master's program no i didn't study quail at all um i looked at habit aspects of quail habitat specifically their winter habitat um but not like not its effect on quail specifically and i, I mean see. there's a lot of I, I was just essentially creating habitat suitability models for I winter see. quail habitat yeah so that i don't really sense. yeah so i don't really know much about like quail physiology and and all that stuff so I see. um there are other other friends of mine who have done much, much more research and have a much better understanding of quail biology and in ecology than, than I do for sure. But yeah. Cause I mean, another, another thing with going with that is obviously, you know, disease and then you're talking about, um, you know, boom and bust stuff with their uh, populations and having to do with droughts and habitat, stuff like that. But aren't like, isn't predation an issue with them as well? Like don't raccoons raid nest and eat eggs and stuff like that. Well, <clears throat> quail are ground nesters. So there, there are, there is some predation that occurs on their eggs. Snakes, small mammals like raccoons and such. I believe coyotes will take the nests as well. And if the hen is around guarding them, they'll probably eat the hen as well. So there are some issues with depredation on the, na- on the, on the, on the nests for mm-hmm. sure. But even so, they, I don't know if it's that in and of itself is enough to attribute to the, to the, well, let me rephrase. Of course it attributes to the population, right? But I don't think that in and of itself is like solely responsible for the decline in, in, uh, quail populations. I see. To my knowledge, anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of reasons why there's such fluctuations in population, but uh, yeah. to find out that there's actually something that we can be doing, you know, with supplemental feed mm-hmm. and stuff is just another thing, you know, in terms yeah. of predation control and stuff like that. So, um, so in addition to all of those, you can have multiple aspects that'll help move that population. So that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty interesting. Yeah, dude, pretty exciting. Oh, and kind of going back to your question about nest depredation, uh, nest predation, 
man, I, I just remember the story. I can't remember who was telling me, but someone I know told me a story where they had these trackers on these quail, right? And they were going out. They were um, telemetry. They were they were going out trying to find these quail, um, and they ended up getting a strong signal and they looked, there was no quail, but there was a rattlesnake. The rattlesnake had eaten the quail. And so they're getting the feedback. Yeah. They're getting the feedback from that transmitter that was in the snake from the quality. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's, it's pretty wild. So are our transmitters on quails, are they like just bands like, like you'd have on like a duck or something or do you know? I, be- I believe they are like little backpacks kind of. That's it's like, cool. you, you could, yeah, you can just Google like a, a telemetry and quail and you see it's like a little pack that's placed on the back of the quail it's not and it's not it doesn't inhibit their movements or like their day-to-day activities so it doesn't really impact their their chances of survival or the survivability of a quail um, which is ideal for any type of um if any type of 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 pack or any type of transmitter you're going to place on an animal you really don't want it to reduce its chance of survival you know right. so it's 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 pretty cool that technology has allowed them to come up with these little tiny things to get really good data still and it still allow them to kind of just do what they do animal movement stuff is super fascinating i think anyway i agree same like with pit tags with fish and stuff like that yeah have you ever it's heard crazy. of bama bass on youtube yes yeah so i watch all his videos every time they come out and he has this five acre pond and he has transmitters. He he put, puts pit tags in all of his fish, um, and then he has, um, I guess, receivers. And he has some at like the end of the docks and stuff. So he's starting to gather all this data and find out what time of day certain fish are going to certain areas. And he keeps it all on a spreadsheet. And so he lets all of his uh, followers uh, name the fish, and he keeps it all on a spreadsheet and shows how many times they've been caught, what they were caught on, what part of the pond they were caught on. And uh, I'm a nerd when it comes to data. So it's interesting to find out how these fish move. But he's learning a lot about, you know, their breeding cycles and how they interact with one another. And then now he has different species in there. And so he has tiger bass in there and he has Florida strain bass in there. And I think he has some rainbow trout in there. And then, of course, some a bunch of different bluegill and threadfin shad, golden shiners. He has all sorts of stuff in there. And uh, it's crazy to just see how it all works with one another. That's awesome, dude. Dang, he took that to another level. That's pretty Dude, small. That's pretty he awesome. Did. He has like underwater cameras and fountains and he's built eagle nests and he has a backyard pond and then he has one called Cedar Falls. It's like this 30,000 gallon like cascading waterfalls down into a pond with like a sandy beach his kids can play in. Then he has the five acre pond and he has an island out there and he has underwater structure and he has feeders and, you know, transmitters in the fish and receivers on the dock and uh, live stream cameras and he has cameras on uh, the Eagle Tower that he built, so they actually have bald eagles and osprey coming up there. And dude, like it's it's he's put a lot of work into it, but it's interesting as hell to watch. Dude, that's pretty awesome. I've 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 heard of him like from many years back when I was getting into like bass fishing and stuff like that with mm-hmm. conventional gear. I haven't watched any like any of his videos in quite honestly like I don't know two three years probably. Dude, he's done a lot just in the past year. You need to go check it out. I should. I should. But all right, so we got that one crossed off the list. Now, do you want to try and talk about the CWD stuff or the uh, the other study? Let's talk about CWD since I don't know much about it. Okay. So, title, so this comes from Outdoor Life, and the title is Our Chronic Racing Disease Fears Making People Quit Deer Hunting. And essentially, again, I just kind of skimmed over this. If you want to read it in more detail, Good outdoor life is a. I didn't write down the date, but it's a fairly new article. Essentially, I think one of the authors or one of the people mentioned the article had gone hunting, shot a deer, and I think they lived in a state where they had they were able to send off samples for CWD CWD testing. Turns out the deer came back positive for CWD. They're faced with a decision whether they should throw away the meat or uh, consume it, and. I think that particular person ended up throwing it away. But then it kind of poised another question. If you live in a state where CWD is pretty prevalent and, or at least in an area where it's very, very prevalent, because there are like hot spots where it can occur. If at what point, like if you keep hunting, right, and you keep shooting deer that are 
in fact, it was CWD. At what point do you think it no longer makes sense to keep hunting and such and so forth? And uh, I thought it to be a very interesting question. So to give a little bit of, of context, let me, let me preface this by saying I am by no means a wildlife diseases biologist or anything like that. Um, I know very little of zoonotic illnesses uh, or zoonotic diseases. Um, done a little bit of research into this. We talked about it in some of my grad classes or my, my college classes, but um, I'm by no means a, uh, an expert in the topic. So chronic wasting disease is a TSE, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. It's a prion disease. So it's not one that's virus or bacteria based. So, you know, like a lot of zoonotic diseases like brucellosis and, um, and other things and other foodborne illnesses like uh, salmonella, you, if you cook the food properly, generally speaking, you can kill the diseases that are in it, making it safe to consume. Prion diseases are not like that. In fact, to destroy a TSE or prion based disease, you have to essentially incinerate the object or the facility or whatever. It, it only by incineration can it be destroyed. So we're talking about a thousand plus degrees Fahrenheit. And these prions can, res, can remain in the soil and the vegetation for many, many years. So even after, um, you have removed the animal from the environment, if it has had saliva dripped anywhere, which is in the later stages of CWD or if it's like urinated somewhere, or defecated somewhere, actually, I don't know if it's in, in feces or not, but if it has dropped any material that has, con that contains it, it can potentially stay there for many years to come, which is why it's, it's just, it's, it's hard for areas where you don't really hear much of areas where it started, like kind of, it just kind of going away. It's, it's, and it's becoming a huge issue. It started in Colorado. It's spread in many states. I think it's even spread to other countries when deer were, that were infected were exported. And it's becoming more of an issue in Texas now, too. It started in a mule deer. Uh, it was first, I guess, noticed in a mule deer out in West Texas back in, I think, 2012. And then it was noticed in a captive whitetail, I believe, in 2015, uh, per Parks and Wildlife's website. And, since then, it has only been spreading. I think there's some some hot spots out in Texas Hill Country. There have been some deer breeding facilities in the state where CWD has been um, has been recorded as well. And there's actually a story not too long ago where a deer breeder, pretty prolific deer breeder here in the state, um, had to pretty much exterminate his entire herd, or rather, Parks and Wildlife did it for him because he could he he, he chose not to do it, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, his entire herd was decimated. And it's, that's another kind of topic for another time, I suppose. Maybe we can talk about it here too, as well, is, is how the deer breeding culture and high fences and all that might influence CWD in this state. But anyways, well, I guess we can talk about that a little later. But yeah, man, so CWD has been kind of a, uh, kind of a big issue, becoming a bigger issue. And it, I think, it is going to be, it can be a health concern for sure. It, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, there has not yet been a case where CWD has jumped from the animal to human. Mm -hmm. But there have been instances where other diseases in the same family have mad cow disease. Um, it's, it's, I can't remember the, the scientific name for us, but, but mad cow disease essentially is a, is in the same family CWD. It's a TSE. It's a prion based disease. Back in the what eighties, nineties, we had that whole like mad cow disease scare thing, whatever going on. And it did, it did jump from, um, bovine cattle to humans. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then in, in humans, we have several different diseases. We have, uh, Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease or Kreutzfeldt Jacobs disease, I believe is a proper pronunciation. I don't, I don't know. And then there is actually one, I think it's called Kuru, if I'm not mistaken. It's a disease in, that was noticed in the cannibalistic tribe in Manila. What country? That or Papua New Guinea or something like no, that? No, yeah, that's what it was. It was Papua New Guinea. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It, and it's also that disease is in the same family as, um, the same family as CWD is from the, you know, it's, it's the TSC thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, there are some other illnesses out there like it. But again, to my knowledge, it's not yet jumped, but that's the key point. Like yet, will it ever? And that's what people are kind of struggling with now because you cannot cook it out of the, out of, out of the food. You can't. Um, You'd have to incinerate it, but at that point, it's there's nothing to consume, right? So, I think at what point is it going to be a health hazard? At what point, you know, would it not be safe to consume? Or I guess it's it's more of risk management, I suppose. How much of a risk are you willing to take? Because people they smoke cigarettes, they smoke cigars, they're willing to engage in some behaviors that are known to not exactly be healthy, right? Um, People like uh, they'll consume fast food and all this stuff that, you know, is not known to be healthy in, in large quantities and things like that. And yet we do, people do this stuff every day. They engage in dangerous behaviors every day, speeding down the highway, drinking, driving, whatever the case may be. So it's all about risk management. But they do all these things knowing full well the implications it may have on their yeah. well-being or rather the impacts it may have on their well-being. So I guess it all just comes down to risk management. How much of a risk are you willing to take? And then I think the other important question to ask is at what point is it like, is it still worth it to go hunting and kill an animal knowing that it's going to be the meat won't be eaten? Like it, it's, you know, you, you're not going to eat it. So is it worth it to take the animal's life if you're not going to consume See, it? That's one thing that I don't understand is there has not once been a recorded case of it being transferred because I, I looked it up uh, when you first started getting the story. There has not been one recorded case of it ever jumping to the human species. So I don't see like me personally, if it's never like, cause think about how long they've been studying CWD for and how many times that they've had, you know, stuff sent off and, and have your meat tested and, and so on and so forth. If there has not been one case, why I, I don't see why somebody would harvest an animal and not eat it. You know, if, and and I get that, but there's always the one, right? There's always patient zero, always. Yeah. So it was there was the same thing for chronic wasting disease, um, for any disease in, in in pretty much in in mankind. I mean, AIDS. Um, there was that uh, avian influenza scare thing that happened, mm -hmm. although it's a totally different um, type of illness that we're talking about. But there yeah. was that crossover. So all it needs is a simple, not I say simple, but all it needs is really some type of mutation or something. Some, maybe that particular human who consumes it has like a genetic disposition that maybe perhaps makes them more susceptible to that type of, um, disease or whatever the case may be. Who knows? You know, that's, there's, there's so many unknowns and things like that. And so I get what you're saying and it makes sense. And there are a lot of people who knowing who know this and who are willing to go and do that. But, you know, and just because it jumps from one person, it doesn't mean there's going to be this massive outbreak, right? It doesn't exactly. mean it's going to be. Yeah. So it's, it's, it just all depends. And, um, to kind of put another caveat on that to kind of get more people thinking in the article, it talks about how CWD tends to spread when deer, where deer populations are highest. Because again, the spreads through like saliva and urination, all the stuff. So if you have deer feeding in all the same spots, it's going to, it's going to increase the rate of spread and all that. So if there's more population density, higher population density, which means more deer, obviously. And if you're not shooting those deer to remove them, because hunters are not wanting to go out there and shoot them because there's a lot of chronic wasting disease, then in a, in a, in a, not in a weird way, you're, only increasing the spread of CWD by not hunting, yeah, by not removing the animals, and that was kind of the uh, at the towards the end of the article, the author who posed, you know, who who kind of poised the question, or I guess who talked about the individual who had hunted, shot the deer, later tested positive. That hunter yeah. stated that they're going to continue to hunt because one, they know they they saved that deer from suffering because it is a slow thing, like. It, it, it can take many years for it to get to the point where the deer will kind of just waste away enough to, to die. And it's 100% fatal. There has never been an animal that's contracted CWD that has lived. 
It's a hundred percent fatal all the time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it, it, it happens really rapidly. Sometimes it takes a long time. So this deer from what the author, from for the individual said, like seemed healthy. Be, he was behaving like a normal deer would behave. Didn't show any signs or what many people consider signs of CWD, but still tested positive. So they ended up, they didn't know at the time, but ended up doing this deer favor by reducing its suffering and all that. So there is something to be said about that as well. And so, yeah, man, so it's kind of a catch 22. You can, if, if you feel uncomfortable about eating the CWD, so you're going to stop hunting. That's one thing, right? But then by doing that, you're also not necessarily, not really helping the case with CWD because it's still going to be spreading due to the high populations. And there can, and I, there, I guess there's some other nuance with that as well about how much hunting really helps the population mm-hmm. or, or how much it really helps control the population. Um, there's different types of mortality. There's, uh, there is additive mortality and there is compensatory mortality. <sighs> Man, this has been a really long time. So forgive me if I get the definitions messed up, but from what I remember, additive mortality is essentially any type of mortality that directly affects the population. Compensatory mortality is essentially where there is where mortality doesn't necessarily, or like some, some event doesn't necessarily affect or impact the mortality until a certain threshold is crossed in which there is a compensation factor applied that in the influences the survivability of the population. So for example, um, let's say hunting, right? Hunting can be compensatory in that every year people go out hunting, right? They take, you know, so many animals. Like I think, I think the, the nationwide statistic is like over a million whites or something like that is harvested every year. And yet, Populations don't aren't like drastically being reduced. This is because these deer will or either we're going to be removed from the population either due to disease or to some kind of like natural death or predators or whatever. They just are being removed by bullets and arrows instead. But and I guess and within that the population or the survival the survivability is compensated for by reducing natural mortality. So when you remove these individuals, there's like more resources, there's like less disease and things like that. So there's some compensation that come some compensation there, hence the name compensatory. So hunting then becomes like additive when there's a direct correlation between the individuals being removed and its impact on the, um, on the population itself. And I mean, there can be, that can be based on region. I mean, that can be small scale, like, like, you know, it can be large scale. It just kind of depends. So there's a lot of nuance with this. So who really knows how much of an effect hunting truly has on controlling populations. Mm -hmm. So if you were to remove these deer by hunting, Who's to say they weren't going to die anyway by some of the means or if CWD is not going to take them anyway. So no one really knows exactly how much hunting is truly going to help with the control of the population. So there's, and I mean, like I said, I'm like, I'm no biologist. This is all just kind of speculation and everything. Right. But that's just kind of what came to my head. No one truly knows how much of a role hunting has in controlling uh, populations. I mean, I, I would imagine if everyone stopped hunting today, there's going to be quite a number of deer. I think that the environment would like see the change for sure. And it would take a little bit of time for things to kind of compensate for the lack of hunters and for natural mortality, to kind of stabilize the population with what the environment can support. I think it'll take some time. I think we do I think in, I think in the grand scheme of things, I think hunters do help because we've been doing it for so long. Um, to some degree anyways. But then, but then again, actually, who knows? Cause we're, there's habitat loss. There's all this other stuff going on. So it'd be an interesting, um, an interesting experiment to run. But anyways, yeah. I'm getting like way off, way off, way off, way off track. Sorry guys. I was going on a tangent, but, um, but yeah, man. So 
chronic wasting disease, overpopulation, all that stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, I understand there's a there's a lot of factors that go into it, but me, my thinking is, if there has never been a recorded instance of it jumping to humans, why would anybody throw out the meat? Why would anybody stop? Like, I don't understand why somebody would stop hunting if if I understand. Yeah, it is possible. Yes, there is, you know, there can be a patient zero, but if it has never existed and it has never happened and there is zero recorded instances, instances of it happening, why by the masses would people stop hunting or stop, you know, uh, eating the meat? That's what I don't understand. And, and I and I guess, okay, it's a possibility because it's happened with similar diseases or similar prions in the past. I get that. But in the masses is what I don't understand. You know, yeah, there's going to be people that are like, eh, you know, I'd rather not. But if there's a lot of people doing it, I don't understand that. But that's the thing, though. You're, I don't think it'll be the mess doing it. I don't, I don't, I would venture to think that most folks who are, who are recreating are doing so with the same mentality you're, you're expressing now. For example, there's, I mean, brucellosis, many black bear out there has trichinosis, um, wild boar carry brucellosis. And I think they can carry trichinosis too, if I'm not mistaken. There are a lot of zoonotic diseases that these wildlife still carry. Um, people are still willing to consume the meat so long as they're able to prepare all that stuff. So there is some risk associated with what we're doing, right? If we're being honest, fishing too, regardless. I mean, heck, even going hunting is dangerous in and of itself. Like you could die, you could fall out of a tree stand, you can accidentally get shot or whatever the case may be. It's, there is always some risk associated with that. I don't think there are going to be enough people who are going to hang up the gun or the bow because of this. Because I mean, this has been a known issue. Yeah. It is getting worse. I do think at some point there are going to be some people who are going to probably stop because it does raise a question of ethics. Like if you are, if an individual is not comfortable enough to consume the meat, will they still, what, what point then is there to continue to hunt? If that's, if, especially if you're like, you're a meat hunter, if you're not a trophy hunter, whatever the case may be, like if, 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 you're not going to eat it, then why do it? You know, and I think some people, I think some people, not a lot of people, I think some people will start to question that. And I think it's a fair question. You know, there's, yes, there's never been a recorded case, but there may be, and maybe they just don't want to be number one. You know, I, there, there are a lot of things I'd rather be first for, and I don't think this is one of those things. So you're not, uh, so, I mean, I mean, although it would kind of be cool to be patient zero to some degree, right? Like, <laughs> like, oh yeah, I was friends with the first guy that got it. <laughs> I knew, <him>. but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, man. I mean, there is some risk. There's always yeah. going to be some risk, you know. Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't. I think we cannot. I don't think it. I don't think we should be complacent in that. There's been many instances in human history where com- complacency has ended. Um, not so well. So all it comes down to is how you personally feel. If this is something, if this is a risk you're willing to take, um, then so be it. But if there's a person who is willing to not, then I think that's fair too. And I don't think they should be um, ridiculed for, for making that decision because, you know, it, it certainly can happen for sure. Uh, for me personally, even though it is, you know, being more prevalent here in Texas, I think I will continue to take that risk. I mean, it's a risk every time I drive home. You know, they're just, I love hunting too much to just kind of leave to quit it. And I, and I, and I like the taste of venison and all that stuff. And, uh, until it does become an issue, um, I think I'll just continue to still hunt myself personally. But yeah, I agree with that. So, but we're coming up on time. So I guess we got to, start cutting it short we're at 40 43 minutes we try to keep snapshots below 45 so yep sorry for my tangents <laughs> you're good <laughs> those of y'all that have not heard about kuru it is an interesting disease if you're into learning about anything like that i highly recommend looking into it but quick synopsis of it is basically there is a cannibalistic tribe in papua new guinea that for years and years actually i think it was may have even been decades that they were losing women and children and they couldn't figure it out. And they assumed that it was some type of spirit or something like that within their tribe. Because these were uh, humans that had not made contact with any of the outside world. So they still lived in their village that they'd lived in for you know millennia. And they had never had anybody from the outside try to contact them. 
And so they were just thinking it was some type of spirit or some type of curse throughout their tribe. And these women and children were getting it. Well, it turns out that whenever somebody would get Kuru and they would die because there was, they started noticing a pattern on how they would die. And um, they figured they had gotten cursed one way or the other. So the, the way that they would actually um, save the memory and the spirit of that person is they would then eat them. But the women were the ones that ate the brain. And the brain is where the prions were, and therefore they would contract it. And it got to a point where if it would have continued down the same path, they would have basically gone extinct. And there was a researcher that went there and was trying to learn about it. And um, nobody would ever take the case. Nobody would ever try to figure out what was going on in this one part. I can't remember the, their name, um, but I want to say they were from England. And they started doing research on this and, and basically got welcomed in the community and figured something out and they were able to figure out what it was. But um, yeah, very interesting. If, if anybody is into stuff like that, highly recommend looking it up, but is there anything else you want to add to that? I'll say no, man. Sounds good. All righty. Well, try not to talk too making- much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank y'all for making it to the end and uh, we'll catch y'all next time. Peace. This has been wildlife outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.